Hey, Barb. Hey, Brad. How you doing? Pretty good. Just need you a co-host. Join on my iPad at the last. I, Zoom is so unreliable on my computer. Oh, I'm sorry. Like every every couple every week, it seems I try to join a meeting and I end up having to reboot in order to get Zoom back into a state where it's happy. Well, that's <laughs> good. Which never any fun. <laughs> Ah, all right. Now it's letting me. I'm going to I'm going to leave here and join on my computer. Okay. I see Rob is here. Hi Barb. I'm back. Hi. <laughs> I'm just trying to find you in the list so I can make you a co-host. There you are. Okay. Thank you. And then I don't see Beryl there yet. Nope. Jan, Beryl, Sean. I can see Sean. Ah, there he is. Make co-host. So we're just missing Beryl and Jan right now. I think. Yep. Don't yep. see. Uh, we do have a comment in the chat window. Could we go over again how to bring up the code presenter view? I tried to open it using the selector from the front page, but it doesn't display for some reason. So I think they mean the scratch code. No, the presenter, the presenter oh. view, yeah, uh, the right. presenter view will be will be fixed on Saturday morning. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, there's also a question: Was the Infinity video the only homework for today? Yep. That was it. I will get I will get video posted of two things: um, writing questions. So I'll get a video of writing questions posted, and we'll also get a video posted about how to use the practice feature um, with your class as well. Yeah, the practice tool. We never did get that. Get to that one. Ah, I like your background, Beryl. Beryl's got a, even a moving one. Yeah, that can be either, a little. Either that or she's at the aquarium somewhere. I am. <laughs> that was a video. <laughs> yeah, I like, I like the relaxing backgrounds. Yours are really nice too. We did have some people asking where that was, Brad. Where what was your your background the the road? Oh yeah, so I'm in rural Wisconsin on a lake, and that's uh, one of the gravel roads that I ride my bike on. I will type that into the chat. So, uh, runestoneinteractive.com. Yeah, the other thing that people were asking for yesterday that we didn't get to was a demonstration of the pair programming. I think I showed that after you left. Oh, okay, good. Barb, you should share your blog too. Oh, yeah, let me find that. <laughs> Where is that thing? Only one I don't see yet is Jan, right? So I think one question that I didn't see answered in the chat was, 
where do students follow their progress? And so um, under that silhouette of a person, under that user menu, there is a show progress button that your students can, can click on or you can click on. And that, that will show them their, um, all of their progress and the grade book entries and so forth. So that's something to point out to them. But we should probably get we should probably get rolling. I'm sure Jan will be here by yep. shortly. So today is exciting because I'm not going to be talking all day. So <laughs> instead, we have some uh, celebrity guest stars uh, who are uh, seasoned users or authors or friends of RuneStone. Uh, so the, we, we've got four people lined up. Um, We've got Sean Joyce, uh, and so Sean, I've known for a few years now, and he's been using RuneStone, and I'll let him tell you more about that. Then we have uh, Jan Pierce after that from Berea, and Jan is both an author and has used to, used RuneStone in the classroom, and even even more fun, she's taught an open source class where they've adopted RuneStone as their project. And then uh, Beryl Hoffman, author of the CS Awesome book. And then Rob Beezer, uh, who I just met last December, the founder of the Pretext Project, which has a lot of goals similar to RuneStone. And uh, we formed a, a really nice partnership with the Pretext group. So I'm excited for you all to hear all of that. So with that, I'm just gonna turn it over to Sean. Oh boy, I didn't prepare anything. <laughs> So um, just a little bit of background, I'm at Heidelberg University, which is in Tiffin, Ohio, uh, only about an hour and a half south, southeast of, of Barb and Mark up at UMIS. Uh, we're a small liberal arts school, and I'm basically a department of one or one and a half. Um, so I'm not sure how we got involved in the applied computing project with Google uh, that Brad mentioned earlier, but we did. And the second um, and subsequent semesters of that project, um, we, we used the Runestone book. And I was learning as I went along. I think maybe, I don't know, I lose track of time at my age, but maybe four or five years ago, I, I used, um, what was it called back then, Brad? It was before you had the Runestone. The um, pro Python programming in context? Yeah programming in context. I believe I used that um, one semester sort of as a supplemental text, but I didn't really realize what was there and what we could do with it. And obviously it's grown since then. And from what I've seen has grown quite a bit in the last two years that I've been using it. Um, so for me, it was a sea change because I was, I was still very much a lecturer and uh, still relatively new to Python when I was when I began using the RuneStone book. Uh, but I was a very quick convert to, you know, I, I had done active learning, but, but you know, a quick convert to quite a bit more active learning and flipped classroom and um, really, really liked the the ability to, you know, we we all have fudge points in our in our grade books, but being able to use reading as a fudge point and see students actually do the reading. And as Brad has shown us the donut charts. Uh, those have been very helpful for me because I am not a preparer, uh, one, because it's just not my nature, but two, because you know I'm teaching four or five classes a term and, and running the department. Um, it's very often that it's two minutes before class um, that I'm taking a look at things. So those have been very useful. Um, but when I can speak, to and, and, and encourage you to use if you're new to the platform is the community of folks that has sort of grown up um, around Runestone and around the project. Um, I found my work in the Applied Computing Project very beneficial in terms of being able to talk to other folks who are doing the same thing, using the same platform. Brad has always been very receptive um, to, to questions and concerns and suggestions for changes. and being able to work with remotely Slack or otherwise with a community of instructors using this material um, has just been a godsend for me. Again, small department, not much time, not much background. Um, so 
So unfortunately, I have not gotten around yet to, to writing some unit tests or anything like that. I need to bone up on those myself before I can um, write some questions. But I, you know, the second and third semesters that I used the book, I was a bit more daring in terms of um, not necessarily creating questions from scratch, but using ones that were there as templates to edit them, to change them. The last two semesters, I used timed exams or timed um, assessments, as, as the book calls them, but I used those as part of my final exam and they seem to work well. Um, the students, I think, have been very receptive. They enjoy being able to see their progress. They enjoy being rewarded for the reading. Um, they sometimes get frustrated and, and, and we've seen this in the last couple of days when they're not, they don't understand why they didn't get credit. Well, it's because you didn't do all these activities. Um, but, but much to my surprise, they had no issues sort of learning the platform on their feet just as it's presented it to them. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, I, I don't want to say too much more, but I'll be happy to take questions. I'm not sure I can answer them, but anyone has observations or, or want to validate or dismiss what I said, feel free to do so. It's one of those things where I wish I had more time uh, to dig and play with it than I've had because it has really, it has really changed my courses for the positive, certainly my CS1s. Um, for the positive. We don't have any questions in the chat window. Does anybody want to unmute and ask any questions? Oh, there's one question now. Have you used pair programming feature? Um, I have both with and without the feature because initially it wasn't there, but I have used it when Brad added the feature. Um, and once students realize that, you know, you have to refresh in order to see the changes um, in your own copy of the browser, um, it's worked very, very well. Um, and I, I am eager is not the right word. Optimistic, maybe. You know, I don't know. None of us knows what we'll see in the fall in terms of even, even if we are face to face, there's no way we can do traditional pair programming with social distancing. Uh, so I, I'm curious to see whether we'll be able to make more use of that, certainly if we're in the physical classroom, but even if we're virtual, you know, for them to be able to use that sort of during a synchronous or even asynchronous time. I also have used quite frequently that share code feature that Brad added where the instructor can sort of seed the students with code. Or, you know, I, I remember a couple of, of classes that, that just the, the projects, the active projects where I was just wandering around did not end up where I wanted them to end up at the end of the hour. Um, and at that point, you know, I would, I would give them sort of my solution to the initial project, which relieved some of their frustration. But then I was able to quickly say, okay, now try adding this or adding that so that they had some sense of accomplishment. So certainly the shared code feature, I made a lot of use of. Um, I did see an improvement. Someone's asking um, in the student's performance in the class. Um, this was interesting because, because we were doing a part of the applied computing project. We were encouraging enrollments by folks who were not CS majors. I mean, it was, it was a split. Our, our, you know, it was the first or second course for our CS majors, but also um, for students who were just interested in, in a little bit of Python. And I think it, it tore down a lot of those sort of initial barriers and fear factor um, simply because of the interactivity and is a, you know, very concise text. It's not bloated with, with a lot of technical terms and the ability to stop every paragraph or two and run a little example or, or do a little exercise. Um, anecdotally, I mean, I haven't dug through to look at grade books, but anecdotally, just from my memory, yes, I've seen quite a bit of improvement um, and success even earlier in the semester than I was seeing before in sort of the traditional, with the traditional books. Can you guys explain a little bit more about the Applied Computing Project? Yeah, you want to tackle that, that Brad? <laughs> Um, I will uh, go ahead. Go ahead. You go ahead, Sean. Well, I will tell you that I believe we were probably involved with poor Brad uh, for a semester in an early iteration, and it was an attempt by Google. Um, and I, I won't get all of the wording <laughs> right, but it was an attempt by Google to get um, to sort of increase the pipeline to to get more students interested in data science and problem solving. We're not necessarily computer science majors, and also to try to um, help 
CS enrollments and help the teaching load by getting what they kept calling CS adjacent folks uh, to teach some of these courses. And before Brad stepped in with Roomsville, we had a semester that was an experiment and, and went as well as we can, can be expected. But the materials we were using by, were, were by a major well-respected university somewhere on the Bay Area on the West Coast. I won't say any more than that. Um, but but there was not much interactivity that I recall. And it was, yeah, that was a nice experiment, but, but we can do better. Uh, and then, and then Brad came in. Yes. <laughs> I, to me, one of the biggest revelations from that was the power of having that kind of community of practice and, uh, you know, just the, the group of instructors that really bonded over the course of a couple of years. Yeah, and I suppose that's no different than, you know, staying in touch with, with colleagues otherwise. But for me, in a small department where, you know, the last time I was able to go to a SIG C was 10 years ago. And on occasion, I might go to one of the CCSC meetings um, in my area. Uh, but the, the community that grew out of that and, and, you know, the sense that you're not alone and that you can bounce. Sorry, got a, got a truck with soybeans going across the um, uh, the, you know, the sense that you can tap these other people, uh, that, that was the best thing I've gotten out of that applied to human experience was just the sense of community and, and sort of the names that I can reach out to. So another question has come in, are your CS students working all their code in RuneStone or do you have them going to a text editor? Um, for, for my purposes in CS1, I have kept them entirely in RuneStone. Again, because we're split between major and non-major, um, towards the end of the semester, the past couple of semesters, I put them in Google Colab just to see if they could replicate their code there. Not because I necessarily wanted them doing data science and pandas kinds of things, but because you know, it removed the barrier of having to install an IDE, having to get the interpreter working. Um, so for CS1, we've, we've kept them in uh, RuneStone for the most part. I have used RecLit from time to time in some of my other courses, but not there. And again, the nice thing about being a small department is, is when they get to our, C we actually sort of have a CS1 and a half before they go on to data structures. And in that semester, they, they wrap Python and do some Java. And at that point, you know, I have been installing an IDE and working with tools. But that was another thing I should have mentioned earlier when someone said, have I noticed an improvement? Yes, an improvement in Python skills because there is so much less frustration, even though Python's not difficult, as difficult to get running as Java, because there was so much less frustration without, you know, they didn't have to worry about, well, does my computer meet all the requirements? What do I need to install? Um, and I have not done, and this is my fault, I have not done any really sort of larger, major end of semester projects that, that they needed to be out of RuneStone to do. Again, from be, because of our course being for both majors and non-majors, um, I've just sort of held that at bay until our second programming seat for course, which is basically for majors. All right. Thank you, Sean. We might have, we have well, one more minute before we got to switch speakers. So anybody else? In uh, what percentage, the question is what percentage of my students are non-majors in CS in that first course? Um, and it's varied over the last two years with the applied computing project, but I would say on average 50% of them. Um, interestingly enough, because that course since we've done it as special topics in one of my projects this summer is to redo the curriculum. Uh, but at the point we were offering it this way with RuneStone, it was not even a gen ed, it was just an elective. Um, our CS0 course is a gen ed science. But, so I've, we've had good or almost 50%, uh, I would say, non-majors taking it out of interest and not even as an attempt to meet a requirement. And this was college. This was you know undergrads, first, second year undergrad. What other majors am I seeing? Um, uh, it's across the board. I get several music majors, some philosophy majors, majors in the sciences, the hard sciences, um, a couple of social science majors. 
I've had two or three students who are English majors and have gone on to do some digital humanities work um, as, as projects in their English, you know, their upper upper level English majors. So it's been across the board. Okay, we, we should uh, move on to Jan. Hi, everybody. Um, so I am Jan Pierce, and I teach at Berea College. I'm the department chair of computer science and also the founder of computer science at Berea College. We're a small school. Um, we only serve underrepresented minority students. Um, all of them are economically disadvantaged, and we have a very high number of uh, ethnic diversity students as well. So. Um, at any rate, uh, in trying to navigate bringing a major online, which I did in 2005, because um, we before that we only had a minor, um, I've been trying to serve as many students from a broad variety of disciplines as possible, um, and that for our CS1 and CS2, because often students only want to take one, of, one, of, one or the other of those. And I was continually frustrated by CS2 which is our data structures course. And um, what we do at Berea, which may or may not be a good idea, and you may or may not do this, but we switch languages. So we start currently in CS1 with Python, and then in CS2, we switch uh, to uh, C++. And um, we have chosen a paper textbook that switched from Python to CS2 to data structures at chapter eight. And um, we tried to teach out of that for a number of years and it, we found it extraordinarily frustrating, myself and another faculty member. And I never wanted to write a textbook, I'm just saying, never thought it was a good idea, never wanted to. But after seeing so many students struggling um, with not being able to learn both data structures and C++. I found Brad's Runestone uh, data structures book and it was in Python and I thought it was an excellent book. So I contacted Brad and said, hey, I'd really like to switch this over to C++ and translate it. And Brad said, and I, I, I'd known Brad a little bit from graduate school. So anyway, Brad said, that sounds like a great idea, and he was very supportive. So I worked with, um, Berea is also a labor school. So what that means is all of our students work. Um, and so I was able to get students to help me translate, which is a big deal if you understand the difference between Python and C++, many, many differences in language, to translate the book from Python into C++. And it was a raging success. Um, the students, for the first time ever in teaching data structures, they loved the book. And, but I was still using a book to transition them that um, was a PDF and it didn't work very well, it wasn't interactive. Um, and so wrote a second book that allowed them to have the experience of transitioning from, from Python to C++ in like about two weeks of the, of the term. And that worked really well as well. So that was sort of my first entree into RuneStone. It might've been about four years ago at this point. Then, um, like I said, I was, I'm department chair. And so last fall, what happened was we had a faculty member who's health compromised, who, who was teaching our open source course uh, using uh, Firefox as the community that she was working with. And um, she, you know, like decided she couldn't teach in the fall. And so I'm like, oh, great. So what am I gonna do? I have zero connection to the Firefox community. So I again contacted Brad and he said, oh yeah, we could do something with RuneStone. That would be really cool. And I have some ideas about how we might 
think about having your students work on the back end. Because before that, I'd only had my students working with me on the front end with the textbooks themselves. And um, so if you go into RuneStone today, what you'll see is that there are several new features that our students from Berea have written, which gave them incredible pride. One of them is the dark mode, which, you know, frankly, as, a, as an older faculty member, I don't understand why people like this. <laughs> They thought it was awesome, right? They, and, and of course, getting those pull requests accepted was super. And then a lot of accessibility features. So on the arrows, as you go to the next uh, part of the chapter, you'll see that it now lists what the chapter name is. That's an accessibility feature that my students got a pull re request accepted for. So. They were incredibly proud of all of this, and they're also incredibly proud of working on the books. I continue to work with them um, each summer, and because we're a labor program, I'm actually able to fund them. So that's really helpful. And uh, so I have students that are able to help me with the books that I wrote before to uh, improve them because as students that took the courses that they were in, they're able to like know what worked for them, what didn't work for them. I've got a student right now who last summer wrote a, um, basically because our students trans go from Python to C++, graphics, uh, I would like to do it in C++, and I used to do it in C++ lots of years ago, but we kind of need it to be easy so that it doesn't derail us from data structures. So I had a student last summer who wrote um, a package that essentially uh, takes the turtle library interface and lays it on a graphics interface for C++, and we were using that on the real hardware using a, uh, an IDE on the real hardware, but this summer what he's doing is he's translating that into uh, being able to run in the browser, building off the work that Barbara Erickson did in Java. So um, anyway, it's been a tremendous journey, and I think all of the students at Berea who've used Runestone Books have benefited, whether they've just been students in the class or they've been students that have been able to work with this that are majors online uh, and uh, working with me this summer. So, and last summer and the summer before. So that's kind of been my journey. Um, so yeah, I, I guess that I'm sort of done and we take questions. Jan, do you wanna demonstrate, uh, share your screen and demonstrate how you get to dark mode? I could do that. I'm, I'm actually not logged in right. Uh, let me take another question while I try to do that at the same time so that, um, yeah, I can uh, bring up a, a, a book. There's a question about uh, any plans to make a Java data structures book. Java's not my forte, so I'm not doing that, but maybe somebody else will. I had one. I think Jan has created a really nice template for how we could make a, a, a parallel Java data structures book in the same way that she made a C data structures book. So, anybody who's interested in becoming an author, just let me know. Brad is very super supportive of authors, I'm just saying. So, can you all see my screen, I hope? Yep. It disappeared right now, but it's just a, this simple toggle that you uh, find down here. If you click on your uh, your person thing, the you know, like to log in or not, you click to dark mode, and there you are. Great question. questions
All right, sounds like we've got a couple of people interested. Awesome. I would be happy to talk to anybody about any of your questions about how to get students involved or you know how to run an open source course. Uh, I was pretty dang scared, I will say, when uh, my faculty member who had been working with uh, uh, <laughs> Firefox that, like decided that she was uh, too sick to work. And I was like, what are we going to do with this class? We've already got students in it. And so Brad was a godsend and it was a great experience for the students. There is a question, is there any plans to make active code in dark mode? Uh, it isn't. Uh, Brad, I thought it was. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't checked. I was about to check right now. Oh, nope. It's white. Okay, there we go. Well, that's my next open source project for my students. Unless somebody else wants to take that on. Because what, what we did with the uh, RuneStone uh, Slack channel was we made an open source contribution uh, channel. Uh, and so actually what, what I was really interested to see is lots of other people have been posting there. And uh, so, you know, your students too could fix this feature. It's actually, so, I, oh, sorry. One way to author books is to hire students to work on them. I've been I've hired several students this summer to work on two books, uh, the How to Think Like Computer Scientist C++ edition and then the Python for Everybody uh, book. Yeah, and I, I have two new books underway as well. Um, one in Think Complexity and uh, yeah, so um, anyway, I agree. Working on, with, with students is great. So I just pasted into the chat uh, a link to the RuneStone blog, and which, which has a bunch of links, uh, both to our Slack channel, which if you're interested in uh, becoming an author or helping out with the writing, that's a, that would be a great place to join. Uh, and also there's a number of Google groups. So I've created a Google group for um, several of the textbooks and I'll get, probably get the rest of them created here this, yet this summer. So, but I would encourage you to also join that Google group um, specific to whatever textbook you're using. So not for Barrels because she's already got a wonderful, a wonderful group already started. But for some of the other books, this will be a new adventure. I'll, I'll try to answer some of the other questions in the chat. All right, so why don't we go ahead and, and move on to Barrel then? Hi everybody, um, I'm Beryl Hoffman. I also teach at a small college and chair um, at Elms College in Western Massachusetts. And um, so last spring, I guess, I was working with the mobile CSP project. And a lot of our CSP teachers wanted to move on to be CSA teachers. And there's a lot of pressure at the schools and students wanting that course as well. So we were looking around for a different curriculum to adopt or change or revise and we ran across Barb Erickson's Java Review course, which is well known. And um, we talked to her and decided to take that book and revise it with the new um, APCSA was just coming out with their, their new unit ordering and everything. And they also were starting a process for curriculum PD providers. So um, now we see us awesome as an official curriculum and PD provider. So you can just choose it when you go to the AP audit and you can just choose it and you know that we follow all of the AP learning objectives and so on. Um, and it's been a great opportunity to, to work on the book and work with Brad and Barb and so on. And it's been a lot of fun. And I think one side effect was the community, the teachers community that formed which is now over a thousand teachers. Amazing, this summer when we got to a thousand. Um, and how many of you are part of that community? If you, if you look down at the bottom, there's reactions and you can do a thumbs up or um, a weave. Yeah, I see lots of thumbs ups, yay. 
you guys are really what's awesome about CS Awesome. I have to say that community is, I, I'm learning so much just by being part of that community and just the instant feedback. You know, we do something new and good or bad, and we get lots of feedback and lots of ideas. So I, I love that community and I'm learning a lot. And part of that community, um, so a teacher from that community, Kate, um, got us started doing J unit tests this summer. So we have some both Barb students and some teachers from that group working hard on creating um, J unit tests for every single act of code in the book this summer. Um, and so you'll notice, you might have already noticed that some are auto graded now and um, we'll work through the whole book and get them all to be auto graded. It turns out to be a lot more difficult than I thought it was gonna be because you have to be flexible enough to, you know, to accept all kinds of different code. There's different ways that people can write um, the code to solve the problem. And um, we wanted the problems to be kind of open-ended, you know, like Mad Libs, choose your own words and things like that. So um, it's difficult, but I think we're, we're doing okay. <laughs> and you guys will be able to judge. Um, all right, so let me just open it up to questions community. And if you guys want to unmute and talk to let's talk. What do you like? What do you not like? What do you need help with? Oh, the teacher's material, someone um, mentioned those and I, I won't take full credit for that. That was actually a group of NIMSI experienced CSA teachers that Mobile CSP hired and NIMSI hired to write the lesson plans as I was redoing Barb's lessons and, and adding stuff, I was releasing them to this group of six or seven teachers who were done writing a lesson plan for it. That was a great process too. Um, and we're, we're still adding to everything. And I, I do want to stress that, you know, it's always a work in progress. Um, and, it's, and we welcome any kind of ideas, you know, things we should change, things that we should add. We welcome all that. Yeah, you can also just go to csawesome.org and it will redirect. Um, what's the best way to do larger project labs in conjunction with CS Awesome? Um, are you thinking about the, the CSA labs? So for those, the College Board labs, we're trying to build in some support for them. Some of the labs already have support. So Barb had a great um, chatbot lab already built in. And I tried to add a little bit with the consumer review lab. Um, and hopefully if we get to the summer, we'll add more support for those too. I think for the larger projects, we, re we really wanted, you know, every lesson to end with some type of programming experience. So it's built in, you know, and then some kind of um, open-ended programming project at the end. Although they're small, but still, you know, so that every day they do something. Um, but I think for larger projects, you probably have to go outside of the book. I mean, at least maybe to REPL, REPL, uh, REPL it, you know, to have more going on. I mean, you could still do them in the book, but you, you probably have to go outside of that. And I think group programming is a great way to go or pair programming um, where students work in groups. We had one teacher, um, Long Naglian, who posted some great ideas using processing um, videos and all kinds of thing and games things like that that i thought were great um, i had a question if i could ask mm -hmm. um so i know that um college board doesn't really care about getting input with scanner but um it, do you think there might be it seems to me maybe i'm wrong on this because i'm kind of um i never really paid attention honestly but it seems like with runes with cs awesome you can't use scanner um for input it seems like we always have to go to replit is there a way maybe to build that capability and that might be a brad question i don't know um it's actually in there right brad it's in the overview book um, I mean, if it's part of, 
standard Java, I, I guess I, I, I haven't tested it, but I, I don't know why it wouldn't work. Oh, well, we have something similar to it in the overview book, but we haven't, well, yeah, we haven't tried it. Yeah, I haven't tried it all in CS Awesome, but there is a feature where you can have a text box and write in your input, and then it gets fed into the program. Right, that's yeah. what I'm um, that's Just what try I'm a scratch that. active code in CS Awesome and see if Scanner works. I've honestly forgotten too much Java or I do that myself. But. Yeah, although I think it is useful to go off and do something with Repl.it too, just to experience another environment. Yeah, I agree. I just wonder if that was just a step, but I yeah, I don't have a problem with using Repl.it. It's fine. I just wonder if that was something. Yeah, might... yeah, no, you're right though. We should, we should look at that more and investigate, mm -hmm. investigate that more. Um, one thing that Brad just built in is the code visualizer. I don't know if you've used that, the code lens button. So now you can do that with all the active codes, which is great. You know, you can trace through the whole code. Yeah, actually, maybe it's just me, but I've, I have seen that and it's worked seemed like the last couple of days. I, I don't know, maybe it's something I have. I have a lot of processes running on my system, but I haven't been able to get that to work right. The code lens, but that might be something on my system. I don't know. But I have used it in the past, in the last like a few weeks ago. Wait, so you're saying Code Lens doesn't work in your browser? Um, no, it does. It's just in the CS Awesome class, the last couple of days, I had been able to get it to work. Hmm. That might be me, me. I don't know. But I've used it before, but in the last couple of days, it's, I don't know. Okay. Um, someone asked. Well, we did do a big new release of, of uh, which changed a lot of code. You know, at Memorial Day weekend, so it's possible that there's something that is causing you trouble that we that we broke in that release. But. Um, someone asked about a pacing guide, and there is one in the resources. Um, I will try to find it and link it in here. So I just tried the code lens. It it took so it takes a little while to pop up, but it did pop up. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was a question about LMS integration. Um, and I don't really know much about that. I think uh, I know a lot of teachers use Google Classroom and they just post the links to each lesson or um, and remind people to log in. Yep. So we talked about this a little bit on, I don't know, I forget, but I mean, the, the, the bottom line is, is that there is an LTI integration that's a part of RuneStone, but right now the only schools that can use it are schools that are running, are running their own server. So we need to do, we need to do some work in RuneStone that, that allows uh, our regular login system to sort of coexist with the LTI login system. And then we also need to create a friendly user interface so that you can do send all the right keys and send, and get all the right dust in place in order to make, <laughs> in order to make your LTI system um, and RuneStone work together. And, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that there's going to be a, a grant that I'll, that I'll get some support for actually spending a significant of time working on that. So it's, it's always difficult, you know, it's, I'm only one person and we have a small group of other people who are working on helping write the code. So if you have ability to code and are really into LTI, I would like nothing more than to, to have somebody join and, and uh, help work on that. Um, so someone asked about the teacher material. So if you go to csawesome.org, you know, you can join the group and then you'll have access to all the lesson plans and everything. Um, so I posted the pacing guide. Um, someone asked, need help with online assessment. What are teachers using for online assessment? Um, and to be honest, I mean, in the AP world, people are now using AP Classroom because there's just so much there um, and it gives them practice with real exam questions but certainly you can make assessments in CS Awesome in RuneStone as well. So 
I would definitely say if you're interested in seeing where we need help, check out our check out our page on GitHub. So we have a lot of issues. I've got a lot of issues that are marked kind of good first issues and help wanted. Uh, so that's a good place. Uh, that's a good place to look for the list of things that we need that we need assistance on. So the RuneStone Interactive has a whole organization on GitHub. So we have repositories for each of the books. We have repositories for the, the RuneStone components, that is the, the stuff that you see, as well as the RuneStone server. So we, we would welcome help in any and all of those areas. Um, and if anyone wants to write um, J unit tests this summer, just email me and I'll get you hooked <laughs> up with the group for that. I did post to the group and got um, some volunteers. Um, so distance learning environment, well, we're all getting lots of practice with that. I know what, when the coronavirus hit, we had a huge upsurge of people joining CS Awesome, and I think part of it was to use it for distance learning. Um, could, could we um, hear from other teachers, actually, and did you feel that it worked well for distance learning? Anybody want to unmute and share? Personally, uh, we didn't have much time to transition. <laughs> it li literally took, uh, I think, two days. Um, so I th think, and I, and I was using it, it was the first year that I used it, um, and my Java knowledge is probably 10 years old. So I was really struggling, partially because the brain was old and partially because I wasn't familiar with the curriculum enough. Um, so I really don't think I did a good job. Um, yeah, I, I was using um, part of it actually in one of my courses to this and my, mine was a college course, so it's a little bit different, but, but um, I think some things work that worked well was just assigning them you know to go look through a lesson and do some exercises and so on before we had a synchronous meeting online um and then they they did have larger labs to work on that that didn't use runestone or anything and and for those actually i was doing these kind of synchronous lab office hours type sessions where everybody would join in but i do have small courses so that really helps you know these I have 20 students at most, um, where I would kind of do a round robin of sharing of screens, you know, so um, they would all be working on something. And then whenever they ran into a problem, instead of in the classroom, they would call me over. Instead, they would share their screen and show show the code. And then everybody would chime in. And it, in a way, it helped because in the classroom, you know, you get the same question over and over again. <laughs> Everyone gets stuck at the same place. And often you have to regroup and say, look, everybody's getting stuck here. But this was faster because people could listen in. Uh, people could help me spot the bugs. Um, so it was actually kind of fun. You know, we did a lot of group debugging, um, which was a lot of fun. So do you suggest having the students read the material before you do the synchronous ahead of time and then do, do the lab work kind of like a flip, flipped classroom? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I kept going back and forth. I, I, I really liked flipped classroom, but I can't do it always. You know, I always, maybe I just like to lecture and that's why I, I like to talk. I don't know. Um, so I always feel the need to re- I, I would give them stuff to do beforehand, and then, you know, some would, some wouldn't. So I always felt the need to go over it a little bit before starting some kind of session of working on stuff. Um, but then, you know, they'd have to go back and finish it, or I would give them also chances to redo it. So I would give them comments. When you're grading, you can give comments, and then they would go back and look at the assignment again, redo it. But I'm once again, I'm I'm talking too much. So someone. Oh, Jan saying she does a flip classroom with runestone. Oh, you... all I can say is my my students loved the curriculum. They really did. Really, um, we'll 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 see we'll see how the how the scores were. But yeah, for the most part, the yeah. the kids that did the work really really liked it. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, anybody else want to share what worked or what didn't, or the flipped classroom, how that works for you? So this is Boo. Flipped Hi. classroom, my students do not like, I don't know if you can, I think you can hear me. My yes. students do not like flipped classroom. They like the live lecture because uh, they've got a lot on their plate and they, uh, I'm going to be here for 40 minutes and I'm going to lecture and I'm going to ask the questions and she's going to respond. And, you know, I personally like the lecture piece too. And they also do. Uh, what I want to know, tell you was that they don't like reading. And I don't know if that's just a common trend. Yeah. They just want to jump to the labs. And so the lecture forces them to slow down and then we can actually cover the concepts and then we can jump to the labs. So when I, I don't know how many of the reading assignments were read, to be honest, sincerely. That's yeah. What um, yeah, actually, that's the one thing that I could I could use help with. I, I I did want to go back through the lessons and anywhere we had too much text to try to cut down <laughs> on the text because we do. And, and I think Barb did a great job of setting this up in the Java Review book of you know giving a little bit of text and then an exercise. You know, so it's more interactive than just having to read. Unfortunately, we have to fit in all those learning objectives that the College Board has, and I had to put them in exactly the way they wanted it, you know. Um, so some of the text that doesn't read very well, it's not my fault, it's the College Board's fault. <laughs> but, no, no. Uh, but yeah, I'm not trying to uh, criticize, I'm uh, sincerely offering. No, 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 not, not at all. But I mean, I could definitely use help with that. So if you come across a lesson or paragraphs where you're, you're you know, no student's going to read this or understand this. If you would just tell me those, just email me, any of you, um, that would be a huge help. I'm just going to keep a running list of sort of issues or feedback that my students give me, and then I will share with you as they come. Yeah, that would be great. All right. I need to jump in and take on my moderator role. So <laughs> we need to move on to our, our, last, uh, our last guest. So... Uh, we can certainly, you know, continue questions after, kind of after we get through everything, as long as people are willing to stick around. But so uh, with that, take it away, Rob. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rob Beezer from the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, I had a surgery on my eye two days ago, so I kind of look like I lost a barroom fight. So I'm not gonna run my video and uh, share that horror with all of you. But we'll do some screen sharing here in a bit. Uh, I started the pretext project about the same time that Brad started uh, RuneStone. So maybe that was kind of the time was right. We're a lot alike in the sense that uh, maybe our mission, our, our aim from the beginning is to provide real quality open source textbooks to students. Uh, I teach mathematics. So that's where we've had sort of most of the uptake. We do have a few books in computer science. Uh, we have a book on music theory, uh, a little bit of physics, a little bit of engineering. So we're trying to be a little bit broader than just mathematics. Uh, another way we're similar is uh, we use markup, uh, use an XML syntax. XML's kind of got a, a bad reputation. I've tried to design what I call the vocabulary to be really natural and uh, use elements and attributes that make sense, borrowed a little bit from HTML, so some of that will be familiar. Another sort of key design decision was that we do the mathematics with LaTeX syntax. So mathematicians and physicists, people that know LaTeX can still write their mathematics. And it's really a JavaScript library called MathJax that allows us to render the LaTeX syntax in an online version. Uh, I'm not going to say we're different than RuneStone. I'm going to say that we're complementary. One of my deals in starting uh, pretext was one source and lots of different outputs. And I'll show you that in a minute when I screen share. Uh, RuneStone has sort of gone strictly for HTML output. And that's great because then Brad hosts it and you get a whole lot of features because you're on a server, recording student answers, observing student behavior. We don't really have that. So a pretext HTML book has lots of interactive features, but it's really on the author to find a place to serve it up. So that's a, a great part of the collaboration we've got going is some of the pretext uh, features can be complementary to RuneStone features. Uh, I'm going to drop a link in the chat to the site, and I'm going to share my screen. 
and Brad, if my uh, if if things don't change as I move from tab to tab, holler. So normally I would hold up a physical copy of Tom Judson's abstract algebra book, which is authored in pretext. But of course, I can't do that. Uh, I see Tom's on the call today. So uh, maybe the key thing here is that Tom's book is available about 450 pages or so for $17 on Amazon. We make a slightly different PDF. Uh, so there's one PDF that's destined for something like print on demand. We use a, make a slightly different PDF that you would look at on your screen. There's just some subtle differences. So this is chapter five of Tom's book and you probably recognize a little bit of mathematics there. And that's all authored in LaTeX. And of course, it's no surprise that we can render the LaTeX in the uh, PDF. I'm going to show you one other thing because it will show up again. Just want to point out one diagram here, pretty simple diagram. Uh, that's authored in a, a language that goes with LaTeX called Tixi for uh, describing a diagram. Oh, that's not the right one. There we go. So this is the HTML version of Tom's book. And again, I'll go to the permutation groups. And you saw maybe a little flash there, but there's the mathematics, same mathematics you were looking at a minute ago, uh, rendering in a web page. There's all kinds of accessibility in the HTML version. So behind that mathematics are spoken versions. A student with a screen reader can turn that on and that'll get picked up and read to them if they're using some kind of a screen reader. There's that same diagram again. So again, that's from the same source. That's an SVG, so it'll scale real nicely if you were to zoom in. We use a feature we call nulls a lot. So you may be looking at this section for the first time. You may be reviewing for an exam. Maybe you don't really care about the proof, but if you do want to read the proof, you just click on that proof there and uh, it all opens up. Lots of cross references, we make that really easy. And again, they tend to open in nulls. So that's a reference to figure 5.23, which is just a little ways back on this page. But if that diagram was back in chapter one or something like that, you could click on this in context link. It would take you back to it and highlight it. So I could show you lots of things that we do in the HTML. The one thing that I'll show today with the time I have is the index. And what's nice about the index is that if you, again, I'm just clicking to the Fs there, rather you don't get a page number, rather than a page number, again, you get one of these uh, nulls. So the first isomorphism theorem shows up twice and you can just open that up. And again, you could open up the proof. And if you wanted to go back to the location where that actually was originally authored, you could do that. Uh, we're getting started on building EPUBs, which I think are better than PDFs. So this is just a little test document that I'm using right now. So we're, we're making good progress on that. We've got the math going okay. That displayed equation needs a little bit of work in terms of how, how big it's scaled. But uh, again, that's just, and that's just some online viewer that I found today. So I wasn't jumping around from place to place. Um, Looks great in iBooks, looks great in Calibre. We build Jupyter Notebooks. So this is actually some uh, worksheets that I've made for my linear algebra course to go along with my textbook. That might look like Python to you. It is actually Sage, which is a huge open source project that does a lot of things like Mathematica and MATLAB, but is uh, based on Python. Great surprise is that because we have real careful semantic source markup, we can make Braille. And that's the MathJax library helping with that. <laughs> what you're looking at is if you studied that carefully, you'd realize that there are only 64 ASCII characters in there. And they all map to individually to a single Braille cell. So you can, with the right software, you can use this to drive an embosser or a uh, electronic display with the pins. I've gotten pretty good at reading some of this stuff. That comma at the top is like a shift. The star is uh, a contraction for CH. 
the right brace is ER, so that's chapter. <laughs> the pound is a number is coming, V is two, so this is chapter two. And you can chase your way through that. Those G's and sevens are like set off examples or theorems that would help a reader locate a big block of text with their fingers. And here's what you're really interested in. And uh, so Brad and I met at a workshop in December. There was sort of a furious six or eight weeks over Christmas, a lot of back and forth. And we were able to turn pretext HTML with minor changes into something that would live nicely inside a RuneStone server. So it's a real testament to what Brad has done. And that should look like the, linear, the abstract algebra book, happens to be my linear algebra book. The only thing that is different is this menu item with the bust on it, and that should look familiar to people. I'm going to go to linear transformations and the first section in there. And what we implemented for the spring semester is we have reading questions. So there was a lot in the chat a few minutes ago about getting students to read the book or they don't like to read the book. So these are questions I've developed over several years where I ask the students to read the book ahead of time and answer them. A key thing that Brad did was that these text boxes are I'll say LaTeX enabled. So I'm the student and I save. That should have rendered as LaTeX. I'm not sure. Oh, I didn't put a <laughs> didn't put a dollar sign on the end. That'll work better. All right. So that's MathJax again rendering that. And uh, Brad added to the instructor interface, made it really easy for me to go through and grade these. I grade them manually because they're free response. All right, so uh, what we're planning is to get more math books. We got about six books sort of lined up for the fall, people that would like to take their pretext book and host it on RuneStone. I need to design some more markup for pretext or a general markup that will map to different question types in RuneStone, like true, false, and multiple choice, and Parsons problems. And uh, another thing we've got going is we already have web work questions tightly integrated with pretext books. Alex Jordan, who's done a lot of that work, is going to do some uh, major engineering to get web work questions to live inside a RuneStone book and communicate with Brad's help, communicate with the uh, infrastructure on a RuneStone server so that correct answers and scores and all those kind of things can be saved within RuneStone. All right, that's what I have. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. And thanks to all of our guests today. Uh, I do want to introduce uh, one final guest. I think uh, Sid, is Sid still on? Sid Grober. Uh, Sid Grover is with Edfinity, and uh, he is uh, he is willing to stick around. But for those of you who who did the extra credit assignment and and looked at Edfinity, or just want to ask uh, Sid some questions or or learn more about it, um, he will be available when we're when we're done here. And I've made him a co-host so he can share screen if he wants to. Awesome. All right, thanks, Barb. Uh, any notification list we can join? I, I would say just join the RuneStone instructors generic list. It's very, very low volume <laughs> and tends to be basically used as, as the announcement list. So that would be the that would be the thing to do. Well, There's with that, I'll, I'm thankful for everybody. Thanks, thanks for joining us this week and all the great feedback and ideas. 
And uh, again, please do feel free to join any of our mail lists or join our Slack channel. I see we've had a couple people join just in the last few minutes and uh, look forward to working with you all. So there's a question about where to join the instructor list. So I, I posted a link a few minutes ago to the, to the RuneStone uh, support page. I posted it again, oops, I posted it to Sid. I'll, I'll post it to everyone. So that, that page has links, all the links for joining all the things. Um, I also posted earlier a link and I'll post that one again as well. This is to the YouTube playlist. And that YouTube playlist has all the videos that I've created so far and the three live sessions. So uh, when I get the video from Barb here sometime later today, I will make sure that I add, uh, I'll add today's session to the playlist. And I'll also make sure that I add the short videos that I'll create on the practice feature and writing questions to that playlist as well. So thanks again to Sean and Jan and Farrell and Rob. Appreciate you helping us out today. And with that, I think we're I think we're finished. Thank you. It's been great. And I do have to run off today because. So, <laughs> Sid, did you want to show people a little bit of Infinity if anyone wants to stay on? Yeah, sure. Um, maybe we could do that in, in a minute. I think you know we could give folks who need to run just a chance to drop off, and then we can go ahead and get started. We're getting lots of thank yous in the chat window. Some people said they'll stick around for Infinity. All right, let me uh, go ahead and uh, All right, I think there's a question for Barrel and then uh, I can go ahead and uh, share my screen and show folks um sure i can answer it in chat if you want to go on go ahead all right so let me share my screen uh barb it says host disabled attendee screen sharing so i thought i made you a co-host sorry that's all right uh let me find you again there you are why did it not work maybe i hit the wrong sid could be <laughs> try it out <laughs> All right, I got a message saying you're the co-host now. That that looks promising. I'll try again. Okay. Uh, gosh, you'd think the more I use Zoom, given how much I'm using Zoom these days, I'd remember where everything is. Your screen near the bottom. Oh, uh, there we go. Okay. Uh, can everyone see a screen that says course catalog? Yep. All right. Great. Uh, so. Uh, I'll assume that folks uh, might not have seen the video because it was, it was pretty short in any case. But in a nutshell, uh, Infinity is an online homework and assessment platform. Um, we've been around for, uh, for quite a while, uh, originally focused on math and physics and statistics. In fact, the first uh, course you see in the top left here uh, is actually Rob Beezer's Linear Algebra book. Um, uh, and we, we initially started with the benefit of some funding from the, the National Science Foundation. Um, and, and now we're using about 200 institu institutions, uh, like I said, originally focused on math and physics. Um, we, we started working with Brad and the RuneStone uh, folks about, I think we first made contact in December and uh, December of this past year. Uh, essentially with the idea of uh, opening Affinity as an assessment platform for educators who are using RuneStone. 
uh, and for auto graded programming exercises and programming assessment types. So uh, we worked with Brad over the last four to five months, uh, originally uh, pr uh, initially focused on the CS1 uh, Python courses. So foundations of Python programming and how to think like a computer scientist. Um, and so the way uh, an educator typically gets started on Affinity, and I think some of you might have done this already because there were a few folks signing up who noted RuneStone as uh, where they had heard us uh, before, uh, before this meeting, um, is there's a course catalog of these pre-built courses and someone might uh, grab the RuneStone course. Uh, this is mapped to the um, how to think like a computer scientist. Uh, they might grab this as a starting point to start using um, in their class. And so this is a customizable starting point that we can use as is. We can edit it in any way, remove assignments, create new assignments, um, and then of course, author new questions. So we can, we can quickly go through all of that. So this might be CS1 at, uh, ABC University, uh, fall 2020. And so uh, maybe we can look at a few example questions, uh, maybe write a new one, and then I can uh, sort of touch on the course building side of things. So uh, I, I have here, uh, and this is the example in, in, in the video that was sent out. Um, it, it's a sequence of questions that builds students up to uh, taking in, uh, writing a function that takes in a string and returns uh, the five most common characters in that string. And uh, so the, the first question in this sequence is uh, giving students a sorted list, essentially testing their understanding of the slice uh, construct in, in Python. Um, and so uh, there's a, I, I wouldn't go so far as to call this an IDE, of course, but there's a, a code editor uh, in the browser that students can use to check syntax. This is an intentional mistake with the index. And so um, this is the sort of feedback a student might get. Uh, various unit tests, one for not uh, messing or mucking with the starter code, another for using the correct syntax, but missing a point perhaps for actually having the correct value. And so if a student, you know, they, they, they might interpret that as, as a hint that the index was not correct, given that their slice was correct. So if they fix that and run it again, um, okay, this time we've got credit for it. And so, uh, of course, we're doing this under the hood using Python's unit test framework. And so if we inspect this question, we have a model solution. We have some unit tests that compare the student's variables values to the solution variable values. Um, we're searching their code for a string to make sure they're doing something in the right way. So this kind of test is of course very common in the loop units where you tell students, uh, you know, do this using a for loop, you might have a unit test that dings them if you find a while in their, uh, in their code. And then another variable check. Um, and so we can, uh, we can write a new question as well. Uh, we can go back to the assignment and click on uh, create problem. And there are simple question types, uh, multiple choice, short answer, which is numeric, uh, sequencing, which is uh, the Parson problem type. I'll create one of those in a moment. But uh, for now, let's quickly create a coding question. Um, and maybe we can extend that question that we, this question that we were just looking at, this was what is called a functions late question, right? So it, it, it doesn't involve functions. So uh, let's maybe turn this question into a question that involves writing a function. So we can say, write a function called slice machine that takes in a list and returns the first two elements of that list. Um, and then maybe we could even say, print the output of your function on uh, this example list. So first you would write your model solution. Uh, so def slice machine, um, 
let's take in a parameter a and return uh, a like that. And then uh, the second part of the question is going to be testing their standard output. So we might have something like this slice machine on um, this test. So now let's go to the unit tests. There's a little wizard here that helps you generate the tests quickly. So it's inferred that slice machine is the function for the question. So you click on that. And so we've got student.slice machine here and solution.slice machine there. And so now we just fill in the argument uh, for the function and it fills it in on both sides and you just click add and it's generated the unit test for you. And the cursor is now over here. This is just a comment if you want to remember what the test is about. And so the second test we might do is um, maybe give them a freebie point like we did earlier for not uh, messing with the function prototype. So we can make sure that slice machine A is in their source. And so that's uh, that test. And so, for example, if we had something like do not use a lambda, not that a student would likely use a lambda for this, but just for the, let me get this message out of the way. Just reminding me that I need to publish the changes. Okay, uh, we can jump back in. Um, so uh, we told the students not to use a lambda. So similarly, we can say that lambda is not in their source. So that's how you'd make sure they're not doing a question in a certain way. And then finally, um, we can we've told them to print the output of their function on this input. So let's make sure that the student standard output is equal to the solution standard output. And so that's the final unit test, which is comparing, uh, comparing that the what the student program writes to standard output is the same as what the model solution is writing to standard output. And then finally, starting code is not required, but this is what you can give students. This is where you put whatever code you want preloaded for them. So in this case, maybe we want to give them the function prototype. And so um, if you preview this question now, uh, that's, that's what it takes to write a question. We have our four unit tests down here and our little code editor here that's preloaded with, uh, with the code that we give them as a starting point. Um, and as you can imagine, in some units, the, pre the starter code is more substantial, like in object-oriented programming, you might give students a full class and ask them to write uh, a new method or the constructor or the comparator. Um, in this case, it's just the prototype. Uh, so that's what writing a coding question looks like. Um, and maybe we can do one more, uh, since uh, I know, uh, you know the Parsons problems are very popular for CS1. Um, uh, Laura, I see your question. I'll, I'll loop back to that at the end. Um, uh, so we call it sequence because we, we wanted a term that uh, the math folks can uh, see as well. It's actually uh, really cool that we created the Parson problem for this project but math educators started using it for proofs because proofs are hard to grade, but they would break the proofs up into blocks and have students arrange the blocks into the correct order to, uh, to prove a mathematical statement. Um, so we call it the sequence type. So we might write something like um, order the code blocks into the right order to write a function that uh, returns true if a number is even. So uh, then what you do is you add the blocks in the correct order over here. So def is even n, and I need to allow it to indent. And then I'll add a block return and modulus two equals zero. And I'll indent it correctly. And then the distractors are, you know, the sort of the mind, the minds that students are supposed to avoid that might trip them up. So we can add one in which we make the parity incorrect. 
and um, maybe one in which we don't put two equal signs. And so, of course, now the students have all of these blocks here, right? And they need to figure out what the, what the right order is. Um, so, so that's what it's like to create a um, Parson problem. So in terms of how you build a course on Infinity, uh, you can start with the pre-built course, which we were setting up here, uh, get rid of the assessments that are not relevant. Maybe you're skipping over debugging for some reason. Um, get rid of those. And then as you're setting up the assignments, uh, you can sort of change the structure of the course to match how you're doing it, get rid of the questions you don't like, and then um, add, uh, add more questions if you want. Um, and as institutions have started using this, um, we, we opened it up for sort of beta for everyone to use um, uh, in, in March. And you know, there were some institutions, Idaho State, Delaware State, that started using it immediately. And the wonderful thing is, as they create content, most of these institutions are very happy to share it. And so there's a growing corpus of assessments that you can pull down into your course. So, if we create a new quiz, like week 10, working with files, uh, this is a new assignment, so it's empty, and we can click Find Problems to go into the problem corpus instead of writing, uh, writing it from scratch. And so then we would filter by uh, the introductory Python problems, and then filter by the questions on files, and then you can see assessments map to this topic. Uh, write a program that does this, create a program that does that, all working with files. And you can pull these down into your course. Uh, and, and conversely, if you, start, uh, if you start building assignments and you'd like to share them with others, by default, anything you create stays in your private space. But if you'd like to share it into the repository for others to use, um, we're, we're always very happy to help you do that. Um, and then, uh, so, so that's how you can, uh, you can build, uh, the, uh, the, uh, build assignments from scratch. Uh, once you're happy with the problems, there's some housekeeping on the settings tab. I won't go through all of this since a lot of it is self-explanatory once you jump in, when it's available, when it's due, late work policy, you can embed resources like YouTube videos, links to the RuneStone book, um, anything that can be embedded on a web page. There's actually a code view here. So if you like that, you know, step through the code line by line thing, uh, that can be embedded in a page. So you can embed it here. Uh, this is, we, we never are trying to replace a textbook. We view Affinity as always being paired with a book. So this is not to replace, you know, any of the instructional content in RuneStone. It's just, if you want students to have access to any material next to the problems, you can put them here. Um, and then on the environment tab uh, are controls for the assessment. So there's homework mode, which is what you saw in which students were uh, given immediate feedback on whether they passed the unit tests or not, or got a question correct or not. Uh, you can also use this as a testing platform as you can imagine, there was a lot of that happening this past term, um, uh, in which case students do not immediately get correctness feedback. They submit their code and the code will be evaluated against the unit tests and, ru and run when you release results for that assessment. And then there's some other controls, like do they get hints and feedback built into the questions and so on. You can turn those on or off or you know, set the number of times they need to try the question before they get the feedback uh, and, and, and so on. So I won't go through all of this. Uh, there's, uh, there's some documentation in our help center explaining all of the settings. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat uh, for, for, those of you who are, for those of you who are interested. Um, but, uh, but the point is that we, we think of things not as assignments or tests, but more as assessments. Uh, and then you can turn it into a homework or a quiz or a test depending on, uh, on what you think uh, is, is, is uh, appropriate for, for the class. Um, okay, so, so that's what building an assignment or a course looks like. 
the final point here is you can share a course uh, the way you can share a RuneStone course with view or edit privileges with anyone. So if someone in a community college makes a course, you can share it with other institutions in your community college system. That happens a lot in math, we see. Uh, and it's, it's really nice because one person does the work and others jump on. It's very similar to the spirit of RuneStone. Um, okay, and then the final thing that's probably worth looking at is how the data actually comes in once students are doing the work. Um, so I have a course here with some fake student data. Um, so we can um, uh, go into one of these assessments. So as students complete the work for this uh, hypothetical exam, their work comes in here. And if you want to inspect their work, you can click on their name. And uh, you see some sort of summary information about their assessment. And you can go through and see their code, the unit tests that they pass, which ones they failed, why they failed them, and so on. Um, and if you want, you can comment the code here uh, and override the scores if you want. Like that. So you can leave comments on the code. Um, and then across your students, there's some aggregate measures of performance. Uh, looks like the distribution for this exam was a little odd. Um, and this answers tab, I won't click on it now because it takes a few minutes to run the report, but answers gives you unit test by unit test, problem by problem performance. So you can see which, uh, which unit tests or which problems are tripping students up. Uh, so a lot of them might have forgotten an edge case if you know the the input is of the wrong format, right? So that's where you can get that sort of that sort of insight. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, across all the assignments, there's a scores tab where you can sort of see your students and the uh, the various assessments. Uh, you can export these to a spreadsheet. Uh, this also supports LTI integration with learning management systems like Canvas and Blackboard and Moodle. So if you do it that way, these grades go straight back um, into, uh, into the LMS gradebook. Um, uh, and, so, and so that's essentially uh, how Infinity works in a nutshell. Um, oh, I guess the last thing is how students actually access your course. Uh, when you set up your course, uh, the first button in the top right is invite students and there's a link that you give to your students. Uh, this is not uh, included. Th this is only if you're not integrated with the learning management system. Uh, if they are, then they access the course um, through the uh, LMS. Uh, so, so that's how um, that's how Edfinity works in a nutshell. Uh, if you're already using the CS1 RuneStone books for Python, um, Java is coming in the fall. Right now, it's only Python. Um, then you can copy the pre-built course, um, and and just for the folks who've done it already, if the name this course was updated today with new questions, so if the course you copied didn't have V two in the title, you should go back and copy it again. Um, so you can start with that, edit that, write your own questions, or just use the pre-built assessments, whatever is easiest with you. Um, and Randy asked, can Infinity integrate with Canvas? Yes, you can integrate Infinity with Canvas. Um, let me put a link in the chat with documentation on that. Affinity.com slash help. Um, so uh, uh, B who asks, yeah, so the final point is cost. So student access uh, costs $17 per term. Uh, and so a term is, is, a, is a semester. Uh, for high schools, and this I think addresses Laura's question as well, uh, for high schools that need a term, uh, a license that lasts through the entire year, um, then uh, it won't be 34, it'll be a little less than 34. If you fall in that bucket, please send me an email. Uh, we're still figuring out the best way to do that. Uh, so um, I'd appreciate some feedback and insight from you if you're looking at using this year to year rather than 
um, rather than uh, on a term to term basis. Uh, and then Diane asks, can institutions pay instead of students? And the answer to that is yes. You pick on the licenses tab, do students pay for this course or will you as uh, the institution purchase access for the course? Um, and so uh, Diana, you would pick the latter in this case. So I'll, I'll put my email in the chat. If someone is, if an institution is thinking about this on a yearly basis rather than a term to term basis, uh, I'd appreciate if you can drop me a line. Like I said, we're still, we're still figuring that out. Um, uh, and so, uh, okay, so B who asks, how does this connect with RuneStone? So there is a course in the catalog that is pre-built and mapped to the RuneStone book, to the RuneStone CS1 book. So if you're using RuneStone, then these are companion assessments that complement the book if you're looking for auto-graded assessments. Um, uh, that's what we do. We don't do the instructional material. That's why we work with RuneStone. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and it's worth mentioning that uh, part of this uh, for, from the Python usage goes towards uh, the RuneStone project. Um, and then Marina asks, will students have access to their notes afterward? Um, yes, they have access to their assessments after they've done them. You just need to make sure they're released to the students and that's setting on the assignment. Yeah, so Barbara clarifies, um, yeah, we, we currently only do this for the Python books. Java is, is coming in the fall. Um, support for, for Java and, and JUnit type tests and that JUnit authoring tool. Um, right now, it's, it's just Python. Um, and then uh, Marina clarifies, do they have access after the semester ends? That is up to you. Um, uh, 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 so a lot of institutions close access because they use the same assessments from one term to the next. So there's a question of protecting the integrity of their assessments. But if you want students to have ac continue to have access, uh, they won't be able to do additional work after the term ends, whenever the term is, but they'll have access to them if you like. Uh, and Tim Humphreys asks if there is a, um, a minimum number of students enrolled. No, there's no minimum. You can, you can use it with any number of students. Um, yeah, so uh, be who, uh, yes, these are assessments and auto graded exercises that complement the RuneStone book. This is not instructional material, right? So we don't write textbooks in math or physics or any other subject. We are focused on, um, on just the assessment piece. Uh, and, and I know we're, we're half past the hour and I wanna be conscious of everyone's time. So um, to get started, some of you have done this already, you just need to sign up at affinity.com. Just make sure you use your institutional email and then it'll be approved and you'll be able to copy the course, start setting things up, do everything that you saw here. And if you have any questions, like there was a question about the five to 10 month license or anything like that, uh, I'll put hello at affinity.com if you forget my name and if you remember my name, Sid at affinity.com. Uh, and both of those will end up in the right place. And then there's some how to get started tutorials and articles and so on at affinity.com uh, slash, slash help. So, uh, so that's affinity uh, in a nutshell. Um, and, uh, you know, you're, you're free to just go ahead and explore it, see if it makes sense for you. There's, there's no restriction on access to educators. Thanks very much, Sid. Thank you, Barb. I think I'm, unless there's any more questions, I was gonna go ahead and close up the meeting. So we can... Yes, this is also in the recording. All right, well, thank you everybody for attending uh, the series of webinars.
Hope you all have a great rest of your day. Well, what was the answer to the question? Yeah, these are just additional. They're, they're not part of the textbooks. They're additional resources that you could use in addition to the textbooks, the ebooks on RuneStone. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Bye, everybody. <laughs>